morning. At least I think it's morning. My, my, my body's on about four or five different, different time zones. Um, uh, as Rick mentioned, uh, I'm, uh, and, and Madam MC, uh, I'm Head of Legal Services at uh, Everton Football Club. Um, and I think the, 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 the fact that uh, Premier League football clubs and, and, and Everton being one of them, um, there is an in-house Head of Legal or, or General Counsel. Um, it's an illustration of actually several of the points that Rick was uh, making in his opening introduction. Um, just how integral and how embedded um, sport and the law actually are. Um, and one area uh, that has developed recently in uh, European sport in particular is the idea of, of legal regulation and, uh, and sports rules that extend beyond the pitch, beyond the the whether the ball crossed the line and, and who's offside and, and who broke the rules. Um, which for the reference, if it was an Everton player, uh, he didn't break the rules, and if it was an Everton shot, the ball uh, definitely did go over the line. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, an Everton. Um, and uh, as I said, this is an area, uh, financial fair play, uh, is the is the general name given to the concept that <coughs> sorry that Rick asked me to uh, speak about. Um, Said to our marketing and IT department that I, I really wish they picked a they picked a, um, a match where the scoreline wasn't nil nil and was one way we were winning. So what I'll do today is take you through financial fair play and regulation of regulation of sport and sport in the law here in, in a uh, developed European market um, and regulation off the pitch. Um, and what I'll do is, first of all, I'll take you through the, the, the background, you know, what, what was the impetus that, oh, oh, oh. Uh, what was the impetus that led to the, uh, the introduction of financial regulation in, in European football. Um, this set of regulations is something that was led by UEFA, the governing body for the, the main football competitions that are played across Europe, the UEFA Champions League uh, and the UEFA Europa League. Um, so I'll take you through the, the, the rules that UEFA have introduced. Um, we can then consider you know, what is the effect of these rules, have they had any effect, uh, before finally moving on to consider some of the, the criticisms of this system. Uh, before, and then finally, uh, I'll take you through some questions about where this is going in the future um, and in particular because this is a legal conference uh, I think the major area where where this system is going is, is into legal challenges uh, and one of those is is already underway now the the main background to the introduction of financial regulation in football is the idea that clubs or, or, or not all clubs uh, but many clubs were spending large amounts of money that they, they didn't have in pursuit of short-term sporting success uh, and at the expense of their long-term health and, uh, and prosperity. And this idea is encapsulated, I think, very well in the report that was published by the UK Parliament uh, House, uh, House of Commons Culture, Media and Sport Committee, uh, and, I, and I think it's, it's such a good one that I've put that quote up there. What they're talking about is that in a sporting context and in a team sport like football, all the studies show that there's a very strong correlation between the success you get and the spending on squad wages. So not, despite everything you read in the paper, transfer fees, 
uh, but actually uh, the, the amount of money that you're paying in players. Um, and because of this, lots of people uh, in clubs decided to increase the amount they were spending to try and deliver sporting success, to try and have a stronger team. Uh, but in sport, by its very nature, there are only a small number of, of organisations that can actually get that success. So for most of the people who were in, in the uh, saying of the House of Commons committee, chasing the dream, um, they were spending money that they didn't have to get success which they inevitably couldn't get. Uh, and that led to uh, financial troubles. Just to illustrate the, the point that the, the, the committee was trying to make about the importance of spending and, and sporting performance, this is a set of slides that were produced by the Premier League in 2012-2013, which show where the teams finished in the league, um, plotted against their wage bill. And actually, if you look at it, it is a near perfect correlation between the spending and league position. Um, the top four teams in spending on wage bills were the top four teams that finished in, in the league that season. So it is a very, very clear correlation. Um, there were two exceptions that year. Uh, one exception was QPR, who, who, who are um, finished last, uh, but had one of the highest wage bills in the league. Uh, another exception, I'm very pleased to say, was Everton Football Club. Um, we were 12th in the wage bill um, and we finished 6th. Um, and that, that's one year, but that's something that we were very proud of. It's something that we do, we do on a, a regular basis every year. Um, and you'll forgive me a little bit of self-indulgence, but that's a <laughs> quote that was put up from commentators on our financial performance, uh, which contains the phrase, arguably the best pound for pound the Premier League's best team um, sentiment I would, uh, I would definitely uh, like to agree with if it wasn't too immodest. Um, so there's, that slide, um, aside from showing Everton are fantastic, um, shows the point that the, the committee was trying to make. There's a very, very clear link between money spent and, for virtually all teams, where you finish in the, in the English Premier League. And UEFA looked at this in light of a number of, of clubs getting into severe financial trouble. Um, and they did a study in 2009, and of the 655 European clubs, more than half were making financial losses. And of that half, 20% were in what UEFA called uh, financial peril. Now in the UK, we had, a, we had a very prominent example of this in the famous Scottish team, uh, Glasgow Rangers Football Club, uh, who are one of the oldest teams in Britain, uh, one of the most successful teams in Britain, uh, and yet two years ago went into administration and liquidation um, and were reborn as a, as, a, as a new club in the lowest division of Scottish football. Um, that slide, by the way, is one I always quite like to use in presentations because, it, it, to me, it illustrates the, uh, the wonderful inventiveness of football fans when it comes to winding up and having a go at your, 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 your opposing football fans. That is a banner that was created, not by any club, but by the supporters of the main rivals of Glasgow Rangers, Glasgow Celtic Football Club. And it is, it is the four horsemen of the apocalypse from Christian theology who have been replaced by, um, from left to right, Neil Lennon, who was then the manager of Glasgow Celtic. Um, that figure on uh, second in, that's actually the symbol used by the Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, the, the UK taxman, uh, because Rangers, a big part of Rangers' debt was to the UK taxman. Um, then that's death, uh, the suggestion that Rangers were, were going to die. And then finally, the, the then owner of Rangers Football Club, Craig White, uh, a man whose takeover of Rangers Football Club was, was such that um, he's subsequently been arrested for, for under the suggestion that the whole thing was, was a fraud. Um, so that's uh, football fans you know, expressing sympathy with their main rivals, uh, main plight. Uh, I think that's fantastically inventive. So, 
massive clubs were getting themselves into trouble. Clubs with 50,000 fans coming every week, with, with well-known international brands, with you know, the, the kind of clubs that, that, that if they'd been run like a sensible business shouldn't have been getting into trouble. Um, and there was another suggestion um, about uh, financial problems and financial fair play in football um, that came from a slightly different angle. And this was the suggestion that uh, somehow using resources generated other than from your revenues was a, was a form of doping. Not the, the doping that, that, that Rick referred to in terms of WADA, but a form of financial doping. Uh, and the, 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 the person who was most expressive about this was the Arsenal manager, Arce Wenger, who, when he found his team being bettered by Chelsea um, in the 2005, and that date's significant because that's a year after uh, Roman Abramovich, the, the, the oil billionaire, took over uh, Chelsea. Um, he, he referred to Chelsea as being a club that was financially doped. Um, and his suggestion was that the money from Abramovich was like the dope that, 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 that athletes sometimes regretfully take. It made Chelsea a, be a better and stronger club than they naturally were, um, and meant that they were were more successful and were were, were beating teams like Arsenal. Um, so he he felt that that was a was a kind of doping, and that there should be regulation of of who can invest in a football club and how they can invest in the football club. Um, and these kind of ideas led UEFA, as the European governing body, to take um, uh, to take action. Uh, and to introduce regulations and laws relating to not things that happen on the pitch, but things that happen off the pitch. And they, they introduced the club licensing and financial fair play regulations, the second bit, of, the, the second half of which being what I'm going to focus on today. Uh, and